Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Intil 2's Zionist Salon. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited to be joined by Joseph Cohen, the founder and head of the Israel Advocacy Movement. Now, unless you've been living under a rock for the past several years, you've likely seen Joseph's face in one of these many amazing pro-Israel videos that has been viewed millions of times. Joseph, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here on your platform. Thank you. Great, thank you. I want to start by asking you about your story. Now, I understood that you didn't have quite a traditional Jewish upbringing, and you actually grew up learning about Marxism and socialism. Can you explain how that happened and how you're now one of the most recognizable faces of pro-Israel advocacy? So it is a long story, but I'll try and keep it brief um, so as not to bore your vis- and viewers. So I was born in a typically working class community in the north of England. My parents were very, very disconnected from, from Judaism. They didn't, our Jewish identity was effectively, we are the victims of Zionism. And when you mm-hmm. come from such an incredible culture that's contributed so much to the world, to have such a negative identity was was really not great. And so I was raised within the, the socialist tradition. I was raised with the patriarchs of socialism, Marx, Engels, etc. And belonging to that tradition, I um, was very, very committed to anti-racism. Um, from a very young age, I was campaigning against Nazi organizations like the National Front, the British National Party. And as I began to connect or reconnect to Judaism, Uh, I realized I couldn't remain in my village. There was no synagogue, there were no Jews, there was, there was nothing going on. And so I moved to, the, to Northwest London, to the Jewish community here where I live today. And one of the things that really frustrated me upon joining the community was experiencing the level of hostility between Jews and Muslims, who mm-hmm. I recognized has so much in common. So I launched an, an initiative called um, JudaismIslam.com, which promoted the commonalities between our two faiths um, in the hope that com- uh, recognizing how similar we are would breed tolerance of each other. And the, the website did very well. It was attracting a million people a year. But wow. Wow. What then happened was the Gaza war, or just before the Gaza war, I started recognizing that there were real problems of anti-Semitism within the Muslim community, and I, I say to an extent wider British society. And so I'd launched a campaign which has gone on to do incredible things, which I can take no credit for, um, which is called the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. It's now run by Gideon Folder and an incredible team who have taken it to heights I could only dream of. They're an incredibly capable group of people. And during uh, while we had the campaign or while I was still associated with the campaign, the Gaza war broke out and we were seeing anti-Semites everywhere. Hamas, Hamas, Jews to the gas, Hitler was right. Everywhere we turned, every rock we lifted up, there was an anti-Semite underneath it. And so it really shocked me and I really recognized the need for the campaign. But then the war stopped. And the anti-Semitism literally disappeared. And I found myself almost feeling a little bit sad. I was like, what are we doing? There's no anti-Semites <laughs> left. There was the weirdest thing. We kept on looking and we weren't finding them. But what persisted was this, I don't hate Jews. I just hate Israelis. I don't hate Judaism. I just hate Zionism. And it suddenly dawned on me that within British society, there is an acceptable anti-Semitism. And that mm-hmm. is anti-Zionism. The hatred of Jews as a collective. And so... I then launched an organization which I now run called the Israel Advocacy Movement. And really, it was to address that problem. So to put that in real terms, if you're in the UK, you're twice as likely to have a negative association with Israel than you are positive. Fortunately, the majority of Britons are actually indifferent. 50% of the UK are neutral on Israel. But those that have right. an opinion are far more likely to. To have a negative view and I launched the Israel advocacy movement to challenge that unfortunately we've been very very successful our videos have reached millions and millions of people they've been shared from head of shared by head of states like Donald Trump and um, Benjamin oh. Netanyahu and one of them the biggest blessings of it is we're reaching communities that most Zionist organizations are unable to during the last conflict our videos were watched by millions of people and a quarter of those views were Or almost a quarter were coming from Muslim majority countries places like Pakistan Bangladesh and so nobody's reaching these communities and um, 
Oh, Hashem, thank God we're able to reach a small number of, of the people that live there and hopefully change some of the narrative. So that's how I really progressed from a socialist to a hardened Zionist. Well done. I have to say it's an inspiring story. So keep on the good work. And I want to take you back to something you were mentioning, right? You were talking about, you know, um, anti-Zionism or, you know, anti-Israel speech really um, sort of replacing the anti-Semitism that you've seen during um, the war in Gaza, protective edge operation. And I wanted to ask you, uh, wouldn't you say that's the same? Of course, we know a lot of people say, just like you meant, mentioned, you know, it's anti-Israel hate, it's criticism about Israel's, you know, uh, treatment towards the Palestinian. It's not the same thing. So my question is to you, is it not really, you know, um, is it not the same thing like we argue? And how would you categorize anti-Zionism, really? So, so it's easier to categorize what Zionism is. And so Zionism was an integral part of Judaism. Every Jew Pay, praise every religious Jew, praise three times a day to return to, to Israel, uh, multiple times, more than three times a day, we, we make these prayers. Um, mm -hmm. Every festival includes the desire to return back to Israel. And outside of Israel, we face 2,000 years of oppression. And what Zionism did, it should be seen as a, a, an inspiration for all downtrodden people. Because Zionism was a movement that liberated Jews from their oppressors and has gone on to save countless Jews from oppression and certain death in a variety of countries. So you had a million Jews who fled the Muslim world, or well, 850,000 from the Arab world plus yeah. other Muslim states. You had the Jews of Soviet, of the USSR, who were facing extreme persecution. Many of those were escaped and give a re, given a home in Israel. The Jews of Ethiopia escaped, given a home in Israel. And so Israel is, or Zionism is the movement that liberated Jews from oppression. It has nothing to do with oppressing any other people. So one of the charges you often hear like is that. things like, Zionism is racism. But in rea reality, anti-Zionism is racism because Zionism, by its definition, only looks to liberate the Jewish people. It doesn't say anything about any other nation, any other ethnicity. Arabs can create a state. Palestinians can create a state. Zionism has nothing to do with what other people do. Anti-Zionism, on the contrast, singles out the Jewish people and says you as a collective are not allowed a state. Every other people, or not every other people, but many, many other people are allowed to pursue statehood, achieve statehood, But you, the Jewish people, you are destined to be forever under the foot of others. And so for me, it's very, very simple. If you're singling out the Jewish people, the Jewish state, and denying us the right for, for, for self-determination and affording that and supporting that with other people, it's anti-Semitism. It's possible to be against the existence of the state of Israel without being an anti-Semite. If you're an anarchist and you're opposed to every single state, then you're treating every state the same. But... It's when you single out the Jewish state and give it a, a focus that you don't apply to any other nation. That's where, for me, it becomes anti-Semitism and why anti-Zionism, by its very definition, is anti-Semitism and is racism. So, of course, you know, the the average person, you know, the pro-Palestinian protesters say, you know, would argue that, you know, we have blockades everywhere. You know, we are restricting the freedom of, uh, of uh, travel for Palestinians. You know, uh, we are an apartheid state, whatever that means. You know, basically, um, you know, it seems that they're they're. They're putting the, you know, the, the fact that Jews have their own, uh, you know, national rights and freedom to their own national home aside and really focusing on what they want for the Palestinians or what is allegedly being deprived of them. What do you say to that? So first, I'll answer in two parts. First, I imagine that you will not be able to find an Israeli that doesn't have criticisms of the current government and previous governments. Mm -hmm. Every, like any other democratic nation, people are critical of the policy. So you can be against the blockade. That doesn't make you an anti-Semite. You can, when is your singling out the, the Jewish state's existence, 
That's what makes you an anti-Semite. The other aspect, the other side of that is when you apply a double standard that you don't apply to any other. So one of the greatest measures for that is in the previous year, there were 100 Israelis and Palestinians killed on both sides, 100 people, which is 100 too many. But the overwhelming Mm -hmm. majority of those are actually Palestinians carrying out terror attacks against Israelis. But that said, nobody wants to see people die. Everybody would rather a world where people weren't being killed. In contrast, you had tens of thousands of people killed in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Yemen. Um, like as the, the during the, the latest round of violence, you had an entire school, like a school, and um, 50 school girls, I think, or certainly 50 people killed in a bombing on a school in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. You had entire villages massacred in Burkina Faso. No protests. No media attention. Instead, in the UK, we had 200,000 people, according to our haters, 200,000 people marching against Israel. And it's this double standard that makes someone anti-Semitic. Criticizing Israeli policies is abs- it's kosher. It's, it's the right thing to do. But that's yeah. policies, that's government. That's not the existence, and that's not applying a double standard to the state. That's a good point. Now, you know, you're seen as, uh, you know, as a person that really shows up to many anti-Israel rallies across the UK. Um, what, what are the protesters really, res- um, what's their response to you? Um, and when you try and, you know, talk to them, is your impression really that they, you know, they fully understand the subject of the Israel-Palestinian conflict or what's happening in, you know, let's say the, the, the current war in Gaza? Or do they simply have a few talking points? I think it's the same as any conflict. Truthfully, if you look at any conflict in the world that people oppose, whether it's what happened in Serbia, Rwanda, whether it's what's happening with the, 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 the Uyghur Muslims in China today, most people have talking points. And that's fine. Nobody's expected to be an expert in every single conflict. That's absolutely fine. But the frustrating part for those of us that are familiar with the conflict is that there is so much misinformation and lies that it is almost it's, it's almost an impossible battle to win in terms of the information war. We're explaining the complexities of the conflict. We're being completely honest. We're showing the truth about Israel, both negative and positive, and the truth about the Palestinian society, both negative and positive. But the other side aren't being as nuanced. Their their message is literally, you stole our land, you're baby killers, both of which are completely fake and false Mm -hmm. accusations. But that's the the level of the narrative. And that tends to be the position of most protesters. They mistakenly believe that Israel is this demonic state um, responsible for all the ills in the world, responsible for the most inhumane human rights records um and it's all lies and it's all lies because we are facing a threat of social media and disinformation and a mainstream media which harbors huge bias and is not honest about the conflict and so it's a real challenge to 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 counter the just the fake narrative and the misinformation that's out there i'm actually really happy you touched on that because my next question was, uh, you know, about the media's role in the uh, Palestinian or Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. And I wanted to ask you, you're obviously active, naturally, mo- mostly um, in the social media arena. Um, I'd say less in the traditional media. How do you really encounter the bias that I think, you know, now is almost an obvious thing that we see in the traditional media? How do you basically, you know, um, counterfeit it? So it's a very, very difficult I mean, it's a thing to, to counter. And effectively, what we have to do is hold media institutions and journalists to, uh, to, to hold them up to what they're actually doing, hold them, make them accountable for the lies that they're spreading. And so as an example, during the last conflict, we have a few channels in the UK. We don't have many. But the BBC, you turn the BBC on, negative, um, really, really anti-Israel, like a strong anti-Israel bias in terms of the mm-hmm. content they were pushing out. So you flip over to, to Channel 4, exactly the same, more misinformation, more anti-Israel content. You, okay, fine, I'm going to go over to Sky. You get exactly the same from, from Sky journalists like Mark Stone. And that, so it's been a really, really problematic um, period for us because 
the, the media is so skewed against Israel. And mm -hmm. the only thing we can do is continue to hold them to account. To uh, We have, um, in the UK at least, we have bodies which oversee the standards of these uh, media platforms, hold them to account via those. But it is a really difficult challenge. And then when you couple that, which is really driving a lot of this, with the social media or the, the, what the public square is saying, and it is so hostile. So, for instance, the protests we experienced this year were so much more anti-Semitic, so much, so greater in number, even though the conflict this time was relatively small compared to previous um, flares of violence between Israel and Hamas or Israel and its neighbours. Yeah. Despite mm -hmm. that, we had more people on the streets. We had more violence. We had targeted the Jewish community. I, I myself was physically assaulted leaving a kosher restaurant. We mm -hmm. had... We had just the most gross examples of anti-Semitism. Uh, just the one example, a convoy mm -hmm. of cars came, traveled 200 miles to drive through my neighborhood and announce on megaphones that they were that Jewish women and Jewish children, female girls, deserve to be raped. Like literally announcing on a megaphone as they drove in a, car, a convoy draped with Palestinian flags they're, they're threatening rape on my family. Um, it's crazy. And th this level of anti-Semitism was unparalleled. And this was all organized by a social media. It's recorded for social media, for TikTok. Um, it's mm -hmm. advertised on social media. And so you have this combination of the mainstream media and social media coming together to just create the most toxic environment for British Jews that I, I can remember. It sounds scary, to be honest. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, to ask in this respect, what do you think can the average Joe, um, you know, do to help really defend Israel's case? So truthfully, I am the average Joe. Um, in fact, the, <laughs> the average, let's say, let's not say the average Joe, let's say the average, um, Moshe has yeah. a much, much better skill set than I have. Never been to university. I'm a nervous speaker. I'm not well versed in it. I'm not as well versed as most of the people I know in the Israeli Palestinian conflict. I don't know. I didn't, before I went to this, know how to operate a camera. I didn't know how to edit a video. I didn't know how to construct the tweet. I've learned all of this myself. And it's Impressive. because if I don't do it, how can I expect anybody else to? And I think every single Jew, irrespective of how pro Israel or, or how religious, so if you care about Jewish survival, and you care about your grandchildren being Jewish, then we have to take action now. You have to take action now. It's on you to create a Twitter account. It's on you to educate people. It's on you. You, you live in an age where you can access millions of people. And I mean millions of people because I've done it. I get millions of people viewing my videos every year. I've got no funding. I've got no nothing. And you can do the same. And you can probably do it much better than I can. You won't stutter. You won't stammer. You <laughs> have better facts. And so, and if you don't have those facts, it's very easy to pick up a book and educate yourself. So we are privileged. When you want to talk about the privileges that we have in our generation, the privilege we have, one mm -hmm. of the greatest privilege, is being able to change narratives and reach millions of people with no money, no experience, no nothing. And so I would encourage everybody that cares about Jewish survival to actually get active and not not to rely on the establishment or other organizations or activists to do it. You should be doing it. Incredible. I mean, um, so you're really, you know, describing the certain experiences that you've had as a Jew in London or in the UK. And I wanted to ask you as someone who's involved in, you know, all of this, uh, of these subjects of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism that's been going on and, and that's really been felt uh, lately in the UK. What would you say as a British citizen, I'm guessing, what would you say to your British leaders? What would you expect them to do? So when, by British leaders, do you mean the government or the, the, government. Of the Jewish community? Uh, the, the government. government. Yep. So... I, truthfully, I think our current government is one of the most pro-Israel governments we've had in a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's an obligation for, for Jews that are living here to, to work with the government, to strengthen those connections. I also am kind of a little Jabotinskyist that I intend to leave the UK 
And so for that reason, I think the politics is best left for those that intend to stay in the UK because it's, it sure. doesn't seem a fair thing to do. I don't see my future in this country and I don't see my grandchildren's future in this country. Um, I hope that our future is in, is in our ancestral homeland. And for that reason, as an individual, don't, um, don't lobby. I don't get involved in the politics. I'll speak out when it's anti-Semitism. So when mm -hmm. there is a government which actively threatens the community here or overseas, then 100% get involved. So it was instrumental in campaigning against Jeremy Corbyn because he posed a direct threat to me, my Jewish family here, and Jews around the world. But in terms of the government, we're very, very blessed at the moment to have a government which is largely on our side, invests in both its relationship with the state of Israel and keeping the Jewish community here safe. Um, thank God Jeremy Corbyn didn't get in. I'd probably thank be God. giving a very, very different answer and probably <laughs> would be very involved in local politics had he done. Um, but yeah, I think we have a good government at the moment. They could always do more, but most nations put their own national interests first but and that's understandable israel puts its interests first america puts its interests first and the uk does the same so as long as they're not treating israel harshly or unfairly i i, I think it's legitimate that they should be able to pursue their own national interests as we do okay yeah fair enough so speaking of really national interest, I wanted to ask you about what your opinion is when it comes to, you know, accusations about uh, Jews living in Judea and Samaria. Legit? So I think it's one of the most interesting moral questions that progressives get asked today, because mm -hmm. every progressive you speak to will tell you how immoral it is for a Jew to live in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank, and how moral it is for an Arab to live on the other side of the green line. And it's so you then get them to expand on that and you ask them, so what does the solution look like? How do these two people reconcile the differences? And mm. well, it's very easy. We have to remove the half a million Jews that are living in the wrong place and move them to the pre-67 side. And it just seems like the most immoral solution that anyone could ever offer that we're in, we're in an age where we look at refugees as a terrible thing. Yet every progressive that I encounter is saying, actually, we need to make half a million Jews refugees again. And that for me isn't a moral solution. What the long term solution for peace between Israelis, Palestinians is. I tend to step out of that because I have, if I if I knew the answer, I'd be promoting it. I think Jews have every right to live in Judea and Samaria. We, we, it's our ancestral homeland. Um, does that mean I support a one-state solution, a federation, a two-state solution? Truthfully, I don't have the answers. I don't. I'm solution agnostic. Anything that brings peace and doesn't lead to refu Jewish refugees or any other refugees for that matter. So I'm not in for population transfers or because it, for me, these are not moral solution to today's for the modern world. I think we can find a way of living together, but I certainly don't think that Jews who've lived, they take Hebron. We've lived in Hebron for centuries. Like in 1517, there was a community that was massacred by Ottomans when um, the Muslim Ottomans from Turkey came in and conquered mm -hmm. the land. They massacred the Jews who were living there. In the, the 20s, again, the Jewish community was ethnically cleansed from Hebron. Jews have a right to live in Hebron. Anyone who says they don't, for me, that's an immoral position. How the future looks, whether it's one state, two states, a million states, I don't know. And truthfully, I can get behind anything which doesn't lead to a, a weakened or a vulnerable Jewish state. And doesn't lead to ethnic cleansing, because I don't think ethnic cleansing is good. It's not a good look for anyone. No, I agree. Um, okay, but let me ask you this. So we understand that the settlements are no, you know, no problem um, on the way to peace. But how would you justify, you know, I mean, obviously, um, if I can say objectively, a lot would say that the fact that both populations are living side by side in what's supposed to eventually become, you know, a Palestinian state, perhaps, is, you know, is really just um, an incentive for more violence, right, for more conflict. And so how would you justify the Jewish people's right to live in Judea and Samaria? I mean, there's every, so it doesn't matter how you measure it, whether you measure it on who is indigenous to the land. So okay. the Jewish people 
are unquestionably indigenous to that region. If you go to any archaeological site there, you're highly likely to uncover ancient Jewish artifacts. If you look and open any of our historical or religious books, you'll read about our experiences in that region. It's where we became a nation. It's where we really became a people. And for centuries and centuries and centuries, we are the only people that ever had a state, with the exception of maybe a crusader state, the only people who had an actual state there that wasn't part of a, a larger empire. And so in terms of indigenous, yes, we are native to the land and there's no escaping that. Every sort of genetics, however you measure it, we, we originate from this region. If you look at it from a legal position, so the, the original mandate of Palestine, as I'm sure you know, and I'm sure all your audience know, it was actually Jordan, Israel, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank and Gaza. And so what happened was the British were awarded, legally were awarded the mandate on the condition they honored the Balfour Declaration, which said that a Jewish national home should be established there. One year after receiving the mandate, the first thing the British did was give away 75 or 78% of the land to the Palestinians. They actually gave it to a family from, from Arabia, um, the Hashemite family, who yeah. came in as the rulers of this new area and ruling over the Palestinians. And so nobody really ever talks about the, the Arabian occupation of Jordan, but we'll ignore that. And so that 78% of the land became Jordan, Transjordan, the Emirate of Jordan, and Jordan today. What was left was supposed to be the Jewish state. So now you have another argument. Okay, fine. So we didn't get all the land. But what remained, which was um, Judea and Samaria, Gaza and Israel, as a pre-67 Israel, that was supposed to be the Jewish state. But again, there was a civil war, which the Palestinians initiated in 47, and which was followed in 48 when Israel declared independence by five Arab armies invading. And so, again... Where the Jewish state kept on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So legally, there is an argument that Jews have every right to live in Judea and Samaria, and it has a Judea and Samaria has every, it should be part of Israel. That should be the Jewish state. However, one of the things I sincerely believe is that life is more important than land, and it is more important that we preserve both Jewish and Arab lives if we can, um, if that means territorial compromise. And there was territorial compromise from our ancestors back in the day, and there can be territorial compromise today. But in terms of morally, legally, um, I think there is, nothing, there is nothing immoral about Jews living in that region. And truthfully, that region being part of, part of a, the is, Israel, pro no, I don't like the term Israel proper, but that just being the state of Israel. But on, as an individual, I would be willing to compromise if it meant that we could guarantee peace between our two people. And I think what you touched on in, in your opening question is the, 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 the real crux of it. It's if you can guarantee peace. And that's the hardest thing to do because every time we've compromised, it's led to further aggression. And I think there's no okay. escaping that. Mm -hmm. All right. Now... I can't, uh, you know, help but uh, see that you have really vast knowledge when it comes to Israeli or Jewish history, especially uh, in the Middle East. And I wanted to ask you, especially, you know, for our viewers' sake, but also for me, for myself, um, how do you educate yourself? Where do you find information when, you know, everyone's aware that there is so much bias going on? Even our educational systems, it's, it's a thing, especially in, in the Israeli higher educational system, that we know that, you know, certain professors or certain syllabuses can take you to very certain places politically. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like you to elaborate on that. So, I th first and foremost, I don't know vastly. <laughs> <laughs> it's very kind of you to say. I have a little bit of knowledge which I'm able to apply. And the overwhelming majority of people who watch my videos are constantly fact-checking me and telling me, actually, you should read this source. I should... Not bad. Um, but I think the most important thing to do is get a balanced um, education. So don't just read your narrative because it's very, very easy to read people who confirm your your own views. And it's nice mm -hmm. to do so. Ah, yeah, I was right. This is the, the this is it's exactly as I thought it was. But that's not yeah. really particularly if you're going to be an activist and you're going to go out there and advocate for the state. 
it's the worst thing you can do is only read your narrative. So if all you ever read is Ephraim Karsh and the, the Jewish historians that confirm what you believe to be true, when you actually go out there to encounter other people, you're going to be left speechless when they come with narratives you've never heard and perspectives you've never heard. And so I think that the most important thing you can do is read both sides because the truth is on our side. And exposure to anti-Israel historians, anti-Israel literature won't turn you away from Zionism, it won't mm -hmm. turn you away from Israel, but it will give you the, an understanding of at least what they believe to be the truth. So I would really recommend reading Jewish historians, pro-Israel historians, the new historians, the old historians, Fraim Karsh, Benny Morris, whoever, um, but also going to the other side, Edward Said and various other Palestinian sources and reading and Arabs and hostile sources and reading those as well, whether they're Jewish or not. Um, but go in there, understand who you're reading. So if you're reading Ilan Pape, read who Ilan mm -hmm. Pape is, read the criticisms about yeah. his work. If you're reading Avi Shleim, if you're reading Shlomo Sand, whoever you're reading, make sure you understand who they are and what the criticisms of their, their, their perspective is. Um, but I think it's really important that you educate yourself in as broad a literature as possible that doesn't just focus on your own narrative because you will never win an argument if you're not familiar with the arguments they're going to use against you. Smart. I love that. And I love the fact that you mentioned that, you know, you certainly have nothing to be afraid of, you know, of exposing yourselves to different anti-materials, uh, supposedly, because the truth is on our side, right? So you can all, only gain from that experience. That's great. Um, and my last question, please, Joseph, is... Um, if you could send out one main, main message, sorry, to not pro-Israel supporters, right? Not to pro-Israel activists, but really to the other side, to, you know, people who are more critical of Israel, whether they have a strong opinion about it or not, whether they completely oppose it, you know, possibly, you know, they might be even the, the people that you meet in the rallies. What would be your main message to them? Find a Zionist, find a Jew and speak to them because the overwhelming majority of people, I'll give you a real example. I got a message on my Facebook page, on the Israel Advocacy Movement Facebook page a few days ago. It was just filled with swear words. F you Israel, die Israeli, Zionist dog, Jews are rats, the worst you could imagine. And I started chatting back. And showing the, the, this young guy who was from Pakistan that I was aware of Islam. And I started talking about the prophets and I started using language that he could relate to, telling him wow. that we believe the same, la ilaha illallah, there's no God but God. And I say, we believe Musa Rasulullah, Moses is his prophet. And through engaging him in a way that he was able to see that actually I'm not a demonic rat, but a human who he has a lot in common with, I was able to flip him. And now literally to this day, he's messaging me every other day, asking for questions about Judaism, showing me things he saw. So he saw, for instance, the March of the Flags. And he was like, how can you, you you're telling me how we're, we're brothers, but how can they be saying this about the Jews? Mm -hmm. And so I sent them back the protests where they're screaming, Chayba, Chayba, Ya Yehud, Yesh, Muhammad Sayyid, which is the, the uh, remember Jews, the remember Chayba, the armies of Muhammad are coming. It, it's another death chant. And so and we, it's on both sides. And so by able to, first and foremost, disarm them and show them that we're human and then present them the actual reality that there's good and bad on both sides. And we have far more to gain if we work together than if we continuously fight with each other. I was able to turn this ordinary Pakistani guy into a friend of the Jewish people. And now he messages me every day, inshallah, we'll have peace. And so it's... so. And it's all because he met me. It's all because, well, then this time it was a pixelated interaction, but he spoke to a Jew. So that if you have hostile views of Israel, if you have hostile views of the Jews, the best thing you can do is reach out to us and say hello, because we're as human as you are. Um, we bleed like you bleed. We laugh like you laugh. And we cry like you cry. And we want peace like you want peace. That was beautiful. Um, thank you for that. I'd like to end on this really positive note, but um, to be honest, it's inspiring. Um, I'm going back now to my Facebook, um, you know, just to check on uh, my messenger notes, see who texted me. 
Um, anyway, Joseph, thank you so much for joining us. It was lovely speaking to you. I hope we get m- plenty more chances in the future and keep on your good work. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much and keep on your good work. You're an incredible organization. You do great work and it's a real, real honor for me to speak here to your audience. So thank you. Thank you so much. See you next time. And thank you, everyone.